All right, if you have your Bibles, open them with me to Philippians chapter 3. This is part 6 of our breakthrough series. In fact, this message is the capstone to the entire series. This is the final installment of the breakthrough series. And hopefully, hopefully in your own life as we've been going through this series and also gathering in our community groups, our breakthrough groups, hopefully you've begun to experience and taste a little bit of, of what breakthrough really is all about. Not just information, not just stories, but actually putting into motion some of the tools and the truths that the Word of God gives us about how to overcome, how to break through barriers, obstacles, how to grow in our faith, how to draw closer to the Lord, how not to be intimidated by things that, that threaten or would otherwise cause us to be afraid to step out of our normal and status quo to really, to really become people that, as the word of God says, to go from glory to glory, from one level of faith to a new level of faith. And this morning, I want to draw your attention to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look here in just a moment, beginning uh, at verse number 1, but I want to talk to you about the price, the press, and the prize of breakthrough. And we're going to look at it through the lens of the Apostle Paul. Look with me here at verse number one of chapter three. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same thing to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence, confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. For Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I might know him in the power of of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed even unto his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which for Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> this is the Apostle Paul speaking and giving us the backstory to his life, to his conversion, and to the focus of his life. And you'll find in this passage that we just read of just over 14 verses that he mentions the price of following Jesus, the press or the process by which we go through the work of sanctification, and ultimately what the prize of our faith, the prize of breakthrough, really is all about. See, years ago, there was this English sculptor. He was a famous artist in England. His name was Henry Moore, and he had a very large, a very influential, and a very illustrious career. And at the end of his life, when he was in his 80s, he was being interviewed, and I asked him, now that you're at the end of your life, obviously you must have found the secret to life. What's the secret of life, Henry Moore? Would you share it with us so that we can learn from you? And here's, here's what Henry Moore said in his 80s, looking back over his very significant and successful life. He said, the secret to life is to have a task something that you do your entire life, something that you bring everything to, every minute of the day for your whole life. And the most important thing is, it must be something that you cannot possibly do. Think about that quote for a second. 
He says it has to be something that you cannot possibly accomplish in your own strength, by yourself. It has to be bigger than you. So I think that those are some pretty massive and very wise words expressed to us by a man who, in, in, by all worldly terms, had success, had significance, was famous, was at the top of his field. And yet, even looking back over his life, we don't know necessarily whether he was a Christian or not or what his faith was. It really doesn't matter. At the end of his life, he's looking back. He says, look, if all your life adds up to is what it should have been on its own, if you left it in neutral, if you left it in its default setting, it would just produce whatever it produced, then there's no meaning to that. But you need to have something in your life that is worth more than anything, that you pour everything into, that you think about every single moment, that brings everything into focus. And then at the end, the most important piece is that from where you start to where you end up, there should be a massive gap that represents your inability to do what you did. Because that's where the incredible, that's where the, the, the powerful, the miraculous abides. It's in that arena where you've done something that you should not possibly have been able to do. And in the faith realm, and in our relationship with God, our life should start a certain way and end in a way that does not fully tell the story. You see, if everything in your life adds up, that he was born here, did this, had this, got this lucky break, was very wise here, did this. If everything in your life by the end of it adds up and orbits around your own significance and your own ability, then there's nothing extraordinary about that. But when you look at somebody whose life doesn't add up to the sum total of its parts, and they did something that was outside of their own arena, it begins to speak to the grace and the power of God's favor and presence in our life. Something extraordinary. And for Paul, as he lists off his pedigree here to us, and he says, look, if anybody's going to have any confidence in the flesh, and when the Bible talks about flesh, it's talking about the outward. There's the spirit, which is the inward. There's the flesh, which is the outward. If anybody's going to have any confidence in their outward achievements, their pedigree, their knowledge, their intellect, he says, look, it would be me. We look back at Paul's life, and Paul started not as Paul, but he started as Saul. Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin, as he lists off there. And he was named after the very first king of Israel, who was Saul. You guys know the story in 1 Kings about how Israel cried out to God and said, God, we want a king like all the other nations of the world. And so God ultimately gave in and said, you can have a king. You pick out your own king. And so who did they pick out? They looked around. They found the best looking, the most powerful from the best family, the tallest. And they said, we want him to be king. And that was Saul. Saul became king, and he was everything on the outside that you would think is powerful and significant. I mean, Saul, it says that he was head and shoulders above everybody else. He's, he's taller than John Zondervan. He's, he's, everybody looks up to him. He's good looking. He's got the chiseled good looks. He ought to be on the cover of GQ magazine. He comes from a great family. He comes from a, a place of influence. He's got money. He's got power. He's, he's everything that the world should look at and say, man, I mean, that's success in life. And so they said, we want him to be king. But what they didn't realize is that even though he was tall on the outside, he was small on the inside. Even though he looked great on the outside, he was insecure on the inside. Even though he came from a great family, he didn't know how to be a great leader. And he ended up losing the kingdom to a man that God said, was obscure, didn't look like much on the outside, but had a heart after his own, and that was David. So when we open up the pages of the New Testament, we find this man, Paul, realized he was named after him. He was raised in a city called Tarsus, which was a metropolitan, maybe one of the three largest cities in the world at that time, and he grew up in that city. He grew up in a very influential Jewish family, and from the earliest of ages, Saul would have been a child prodigy when it came to the Jewish law. He went to Sunday school, much like you and I did. He went to Sabbath school in this local synagogue. What we know from history is that people who became scholars, experts, leaders 
in the Jewish faith were those that showed a propensity towards understanding and knowledge and wisdom, even at a young age. So we know that Paul would have because his family sent him from Tarsus to Jerusalem. And what we find is that in the early chapters of Acts, here's young Saul who's being trained up by the greatest theological mind of his day, of his day whose name is Gamaliel. You can read about Gamaliel in secular history as well as in biblical history. He was brilliant. He was a scholar of scholars. He was an expert in Greek philosophy as well. And so what we know is that Saul of Tarsus was sent by his parents in his local synagogue to go to Jerusalem and learn from the best of the best. He's named after the king. He's super wise. His future is laid out in front of him. He's there in Acts chapter 8, when Stephen, the early Christian evangelist, is preaching, and the religious leaders gather around Stephen and stone him for blasphemy because he said that Jesus was God. And the Bible tells us that Saul is standing there holding the tunics of the other members of the governing body of Israel, the Sanhedrin council, while they stone Stephen to death, and he's even giving his consent, which implies that young Saul is probably being trained and groomed to have a political future as well as a religious future. And he describes in Philippians chapter three that he was circumcised, that means he has a covenant with God through Abraham on the eighth day. He's from the tribe of Benjamin, that's like an elite tribe. He is, according to his doctrine, he's a Pharisee, which means he's the most literal, fundamental, zealous, keeper of the Jewish faith. And here's what he also says about himself. He says, when it comes to the righteousness that is found through the keeping of the law, as much as he knows about himself, he never violated the law of Moses one time. 613 laws that you can read about in Leviticus. That according to himself, he called himself blameless. That meant as much as he knows about himself, he never ate that, which means I violate the law all the time because I like bacon. Can anybody relate to that? I mean, poor Saul, he never had bacon. I know, poor Saul. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he said, when it came to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. He hated Christians. He hated the church. He hated Jesus. You want to know how well he knew the Bible? He knew the Bible, the Old Testament, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He knew it word for word by memory in three different languages before the age of 12. He was a scholar of scholars. And he was passionate about his faith and passionate about defending it against all enemies including Christianity, this Nazarene who rose up and claimed to be the Messiah who ended up getting himself crucified. And it was an affront to him because you see, for him as a Pharisee, his desire was that the Messiah would be a political figure who would overthrow their enemies and usher in a time of Jewish golden age in which they would have political power once again. And the enemies, the Gentiles, the Romans, the Greeks would get out of their country. And one day he's so zealous about his faith that he asks the leaders for permission to track down Christians that he's heard about that live in Damascus, Syria. It's a multiple hundred mile journey from Jerusalem. And he does it on horseback with letters giving him permission to arrest Christians. That's how zealous he is about this. This is how bad he hates Jesus, how bad he hates this sect called Christians. And as he's riding his horse with his retinue on the way to Damascus, he has an encounter unlike anything else he's ever had in his life with the resurrected Messiah of Israel, Jesus. It says that a light shone from heaven probably felt like the light coming off of a 747. It knocked him off of his horse. He heard a voice. And out of this light, the voice came forward that said, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And he responds back, probably thinking, it's the angel of the Lord. I have a theological premise for that in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua. And so he says, Lord, Lord, who are you? And imagine his utter shock when he hears, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Everything changed in his life. In one moment, the very one he hated was speaking to him. 
and began to lay out for Paul or Saul what he would suffer and what he was created for, what he was called to, to be a light to the Gentiles. Rise up and go into the city to a street called Straight, and there you will find a man who will take you in and he will baptize you and he will tell you about the way because I have appointed you to be a voice to the Gentiles, to stand before kings as a witness of me and of my resurrection. You see, everything changed in a moment for Saul. What changed? Everything in that moment. Because that's exactly what Paul begins to go into great detail about in chapter 3. He begins to talk about the price that he paid and the process he went through, but ultimately the prize that he gained in this moment. And what I can tell you is this, is that every single one of us are going to pay a price in life if we want to experience breakthrough and follow Jesus wholeheartedly. There is a price to pay, There is a process to go through, but there is a prize to win for those who will aggressively pursue Jesus at all costs. You see, at the end of our day, we're going to have to be willing to put things into perspective, the price that we pay in order to experience breakthrough, to allow God to break through us in order to break through all of our false pursuits and paradigms. It's a price. Verse number eight, Paul says this. He says, yet indeed, I now count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. You might be wondering, how did, how did Saul become Paul? Saul is the name of a king, but Paul eventually changes his name to Paul, which is a Greek name. Because now the very people that he once hated are the very ones that he was called by Jesus to go and witness to. So in order to identify, he changes his name. Think about the heart change that has to occur in you first before you're willing to change your name. You want to know how radical Paul's conversion was? I want you to imagine right now if a leader in ISIS were to suddenly have a vision of Jesus and miraculously be converted to Christianity, and all of a sudden he shows up in Richland, Michigan, and walks down the aisle and begins to worship Jesus. That's about as radical as Paul's conversion was. But it cost him everything. It cost him everything. He said, I've counted all things as loss, that I might gain Christ. What did he lose? Well, what we know is that Paul had a bounty put on his head. People wanted to kill him. In fact, some people made a vow saying, I'm not going to eat or drink or sleep until we kill Saul for his blasphemy. How many know that was a bad call to make because they never tracked him down? We know this. We know that he lost his position. We know that he lost his future. We know that he lost wealth. He may have even lost a family. He lost everything that was familiar to him. But he didn't consider it a price too great to pay. It was a price he was willing to, willing to pay. It was things he was willing to lay down in order to gain Christ. In other words, he was willing to let go of the familiar in order to gain the faithful. He was willing to pay whatever price because he had found something in Jesus in that moment that was more beautiful and incomparable than anything that he had worked his whole life for. It was incomparable. Just one moment to hear the voice of the one who created you speak your name will put everything else in perspective. It's a price that redefines success for us. How many know that we live in a world that's pretty wrapped up in success, the pursuit of success? I mean, we re- all of us are kind of hardwired that way. We're hardwired from the time we're little to be the best, to achieve, to strive, to work hard, earn money, get your degree. And not like any of those things are wrong. Not like any of those things are bad. In fact, most of those things are really good. I'm not one of these guys who thinks that, you know, when it comes to sports, we shouldn't keep score or hand out prizes or ribbons. It's like, oh, look, everybody's just having fun. It's wonderful. Score doesn't matter. No, score matters. (laughs) Scoreboards matter. Effort matters. But... It, 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 in our culture, we have, we've taken things that are good when they're put in perspective, and we've turned them into things that become slave masters, that control our lives. 
things that become familiar, so familiar to us because we've always been around them. We, we, we determine whether our day is good or bad by whether we're making money or losing money. The stock market goes up, man, it's a great day. Stock market goes down, it's a bad day. How's your 401k doing? Did you get that promotion? Who got the raise? All of these different types of things. And again, look, let's achieve, let's go. But why are we doing it? What's the end result of it? And the problem with the way that we have defined success is basically we've come up with a moniker that says he who dies with the most toys, the most money, the most significance, the most followers on social media wins. And so the finish line has been placed at the end of our lives. And it's like, what you can do in this world, what you can attain in this world, what you can gather to yourself, the market share you can get, then that's the terms of success. And Paul says, look, I had all that. I was the best of the best. I was the smartest of the smartest. I was networked. I was plugged in. I had it all. But I chose to count it as loss because there came this moment where I had to be willing to let go of this in order to grab hold and to pursue so I could get a hold of this. It's like, you know, I, re I remember one time when I was little, my, my grandfather took me into a candy store, Richardson's Dairy in Clarkston, Michigan. And I was little, my, my grandfather wanted me to pick out some candy. And so I was used to going into that store with my mom, and my mom would always say, just pick out some penny candy. And so, you know, I went right over to the penny candy. And when I go over to the penny candy, I just, I, I, Grandpa's like, grab, grab some. So I, you know, I had like a couple handfuls of penny candy, and Grandpa comes over and he goes, you know what, you don't want that. That's, no, no, get something really good. So I like put all like gobstoppers and Jolly Ranchers back into the jar. Then I go over to the nickel candy. Come on, somebody. That's when you're stepping up in the world. It's like, so I, I filled my hands with nickel candy. That was like sweet tarts and Charleston chews and stuff like that. You guys remember that? Like baby roots. And I had, you know, the little mini ones. So I had my hands full of, my grandpa had in his mind that he wanted to get me one of those big slow pokes. Do you guys remember those? They were like a, an oar for a canoe. And every dentist loves them because your fillings all come out and their business goes up. And so, my grandpa had one of those, and he's like, no, I want to get you this. But I had my hand full of the nickel candy. I wanted what he had, but I'm holding it, and he's like, here, take this. I couldn't take it because I had my hands full of the nickel candy. And he's like, put that down and take this. A lot of times, we've got nothing but the nickel candy of life. And the Lord's like, hey, I've got this. And we're like, well, I want that too. He says, you got to let go of that before you can take this. And a lot of times we're living for things in this world that we think, oh man, status is everything. Can I just tell you, everything that you gain in this world stays in this world. You can get a lot of money, you can stack, you can stack the bills. When you take your last breath, it stays here. Somebody else will spend your money. You can... Gain followers on Facebook. How many have ever noticed, can we just be truthful? Have, have you ever noticed on your Facebook, all of a sudden one day you click on it and you realize somebody unfollowed you? Does anybody ever realize that? I think it's one of the most passive aggressive things you can do. People do it all the time though. It's like, hey, I just lost 10 followers. And then you can actually download an app that will tell you who they are. Now, I don't, I'm not on Facebook anymore. Thank the Lord, I've been delivered. I have a public image page. But, you know, I, I, the reason I got off, because that kind of thing drove me crazy. Can I tell you, the only followers that matter in your life are the ones that are following Jesus by watching your example that you take with you into eternity. That's all that matters. Your selfie, I mean, status, everybody's on there, oh, we got to get my selfie, and I, you know, I got I to gotta work out, because if I work out, then I'll get packs like Pastor Andrew, and then I can, like, take <laughs> selfies and, mm, check it like this, and then I'll get more followers, and then I've got more influence, and then I can make more money, and then I'm more, all that stuff stays here. They've excavated pyramids, and they filled those pyramids with gold, with food, with clothes, and with servants. 
so that the pharaohs who were very wealthy could take them into the next life. Guess what? They're all still in the pyramid. It all goes back in the box, kids. Except that which is eternal. Now, when you use your money, when you use your status, when you use your significance, when you use your gifts for things that are eternal in order to please the one who has revealed himself to you, that's when things shift gears. Because if you live for this world, you become a servant of this world. But when you allow the things in this world to become tools by which you shape eternity and your reward in eternity, all of a sudden now, you, the Lord is in control and you're pursuing the right things. You see, so many of us need to respond to the words of Paul where we count all things as loss in our life. There's some things you need to let go. You need to let go of, of your past your, your pain, you need to let go of your fears because there's none, nothing in those things that you want to take with you into your future. Can I just tell you that in Christ, pain is no longer your compass. Fear is no longer your leader. And status is no longer your standing. Sometimes we allow our pain to be the compass that dictates the direction that we move in our life. And it will never lead you it will never lead you to what you were created for. Sometimes we allow fear to be our leader. It whispers into our, our ear telling us, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that you as a child of God are, are no longer dictated by fear, but you've been set free of that bondage, and now you are a son or a daughter of God that clearly hears the voice of the Holy Spirit telling you which way to go based out of the character and the nature of the God that you serve who's revealed himself as a father. And status is no longer your standing. Paul gripped this. He understood this. Even though he lost earthly status he gained eternal standing. You see, because your status in this world can shift and change. But your standing in Christ is eternal. You are standing in grace. You are seated in heavenly places. You are accepted in the beloved. You have an inheritance. You are filled with the greater one of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. The power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. Your days and your destiny were written in a book before you ever took your first breath. God has said, I have loved you with an everlasting love and that you are an overcomer and a conqueror and no weapon formed against you can prosper and every voice that rises up you, against you will be put down. You see, your standing in Christ cannot be altered regardless of your status in society. And can I tell you that for us as American Christians, we don't understand price. We don't understand price. For us, we, we feel like we're being persecuted if somebody rolls their eyes at us when we bring our Bible into Starbucks. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, I've been persecuted. No, you're Well, there are people that lose their heads for their faith. There are people whose homes are burned down for their faith. See, sometimes I fear like our, our faith muscle has so atrophied. See, atrophy happens in your muscles when there's no resistance to build the muscle up. You and I are continually rebuilding our muscles because we live in a gravitational world where there's pressure that is being weighed down, pushing us into the earth, and so we have to exert ourselves against it, and it reinforces our muscular development and our strength. But you take a human being and you put them in a zero-gravity environment like space and leave them there for nine months, and because there's no resistance, because there's no pressure being applied, your muscle begins to break down. And even though we live in a great, I, I love America. I, I think it's great. I'm not one of these people that's like, let's get rid of all the comforts. I, I love comfort. My idea of camping is the JW Marriott, baby. I mean, <laughs> let's go. But listen, spiritually what happens is because we don't experience pressure being applied against the muscle of our faith. Here's what happens. Our faith begins to atrophy and we get weak because we're not paying a price. That's why you can go to third world nations and their faith is massive. It's not because of the things that they don't have that make them stronger. It's the things that they do have that make them stronger. They have a strong faith. They have a close connection and they have an eternal perspective. 
There's a price attached to the breakthrough that Jesus offers us. Number two is the press, which really has to do with the process. In verse 14, Paul says, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see the word press there is a word that means aggressive pursuit. Aggressive pursuit. You will not grow in your faith by living your life in neutral. The other day I was driving into the Bob and Kay's car wash. And you know, when you pull in, you have to align your tires. You guys ever done this? You align your tires and then when you pull in, it says, stop, put your car in neutral, hands off the steering wheel, sit back and enjoy the ride. You guys have heard that before, right? You've done it. So I pulled in, I put my car up in neutral and I'm checking my phone. And, you know, going through all the different phases, I know that when I hear the fans, it's time to get ready to pull out, especially when there's a lineup of cars. So we near the end of the Bob and Kay's car wash experience, and we're coming out, and near the end, and the sign says, thank you, and have a great day. And um, I'm at the end of it, and I, I push down the gas pedal, and it wouldn't go anywhere, because I'm still in neutral. So I had to click it down into drive, and all of a sudden, boom, you know, you can jump, because the accelerator's been pushed. I think sometimes we're living our life in neutral, wondering why we're not experiencing breakthrough in the process. It's because progress doesn't happen when you live your life in neutral. Some of us, we shift, we, we go to the extreme, we shift up in the park because of what we've been through or because of our fear or because of our pain. We don't want to go through the process. We're just like, God, if you really wanted something to change in my life, you would just do it. But God says that's not how this works. God, I tried it before. I really tried to do it your way, but it's difficult. I came up against opposition. I came up against walls. The enemy had his way in my life. I, I failed, and so I don't want to do that again, so I put my life in the park. And what God wants us to know about the press, what Paul says is, I press on, I press towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, is that you and I have to aggressively pursue Jesus. It takes time, it takes energy, it's a process. We've got to aggressively press into and pursue breakthrough and change and transformation in our life. It would be nice if it all happened overnight, but it doesn't happen that way. It would be nice if all of our enemies, we woke up tomorrow and, and the enemy, the devil, and all of his demons were no longer attacking humanity. It would be awesome. It would be wonderful if you woke up tomorrow and you had that degree and didn't have to finish your program. It'd be fantastic tomorrow if you checked your balance in your, in your checking account <coughs> and it was flush. It'd be awesome. We all pray those kind of prayers. But that's not the end game that God has for us. Because what you need to understand is that God is also the God of the process. While you are, while you are passionately and aggressively pursuing Jesus, you need to understand that God is aggressively and passionately pursuing you. And there is a process that God is concerned about. You see, we're so focused on the end game, the results of what we have and what we will be doing, we forget that God is more concerned about who we will be when we get there. We look at the process as, as pain that we have to endure to get what we want. God looks at process as the pain that we have to go through in order to be who he wants us to be. And that's why we try and circumvent the process. There's this scripture in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 7. God is bringing Joshua and the children of Israel finally into the promised land. I mean, it's 40 years they've been wandering around in the wilderness. And now they're about to go in. And as they're about to go in, God speaks to them about the process. In verse 21, it says, you shall not be terrified of them. Talking about the, the nations and the people that are in the land. He says, you shall not be terrified of them. For the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. And the Lord your God, listen to this, he will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will be unable to destroy them all at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. 
But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you and will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. God says, don't worry. I'm going with you into the process. And you're going to come up against opposition. And when you do, know this. You're not going to defeat it all at once. You're not going to get the breakthrough all at once. Life's not going to change in one snap of the fingers. You're going to receive the victory. I'm going to win the battle for you, but it's going to happen little by little process. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that the inward man is renewed day by day, little by little. Why is that significant? Well, God says the reason why he does it is this. He says, if, if you were to defeat them all at once, the beasts of the field, the wild animals would multiply in the land beyond your ability to deal with them. So what does that have? Uh, what's the application for you and I? It's this, is that if God gives us a breakthrough bigger than our character before it has been developed, it will leave a void in our life where the enemy will come in and fill territory that our character is not able to possess. So God says, I've got to take you through this process because it's in the process that according to Romans chapter eight, God is conforming us into the image of Christ. It's the price, it's the prize, or the, the press, and it's the prize. What's the prize? Look at what Paul says. Verse 14, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, sometimes we think of a prize as something that we're going to possess. And what Paul came to understand is that the prize, what makes it all worth it, is that when we realize that we're known by God, and that we know that God knows us, and we discover once and for all that everything that we've been striving for in our own strength is already ours because it's found in a person and not in a place. We realize that Jesus is the prize. Jesus is the prize. To know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, Paul said, that's what I want more than anything because he realized everything I'm searching for is in him. Significance is in him. Purpose is in him. He's the one who gave me life, so therefore he knows how I'm structured. He's the one who wired me with the desires that I have, the gifts and the abilities that I have. So when my whole life comes into alignment with the one who created me, that's when God is most satisfied. John Piper says it like this, God is most glorified when you and I are most satisfied in him. Think about that. He is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. We've been running this race thinking that at the end of it, we want a medal. And what we don't realize is that at the end of it, the prize of the race of faith that we're running is actually a person. Let me illustrate it to you in closing like this. This is a true story. A young man about five to, somewhere between five and 10 years ago, I read this story. About a young man whose father was deployed in Afghanistan for multiple tours, like many of you veterans. And he was gone away from his family far more than he wanted to. And over the course of him being gone, he would come back at different times. And when he would come back, he had a son. And the one thing that they would have in common is the son would go for runs with his dad. Dad would come home and say, let's go for a run. So they would go for a run. His dad enjoyed running marathons. So when the, the young man grew up and became a teenager and his dad was in Afghanistan, he took up running because it helped him connect with his dad. Even though he couldn't see his dad, he knew that it was something that his dad enjoyed, so he would go out running. And then in his high school years, he decided, I'm going to run a marathon. Dad loved to run marathons. I'm going to run a marathon. So he began to train day after day, week after week for several months. And he had a marathon that he had signed up for. And as marathon day approached, he was thinking about all of the work that he had gone through to get to this moment process and the price that he had paid but it was worth it. And he took the starting line with his little bib on and knew that he had trained well and he took off in the first mile, first five miles, first 10 miles. He got to mile 15 and he felt so good. He thought to himself, man, I, I think I'm gonna do really well here. I wonder how good I can do. He looked at his pace on his watch and he thought, I am, man, I'm doing way better than I thought I was gonna do. He got to mile 20 which so many people had told him, when you hit mile 20, it's the wall. I mean, you're, you gotta break through the wall. And he went through the wall 
like a hot knife through butter. He didn't even, he didn't even slow down for a second. And his pace was faster than he ever imagined he would be able to run an entire marathon. He thought, he began to think to himself, I bet you I'm gonna place in my age group. I bet you I, I, I'm gonna do really well in the overall standings. If I could just keep this pace. The last few miles of the race, he began to think about his friends he knew were running the race and other people that he knew that he hadn't seen. He knew that he was further up ahead and he began to think about the medal, the placing, about the bragging rights, about how good it was going to feel to know that he had accomplished this. And when, when he got within 100 yards of the marathon's finish line, he looked up ahead and he saw all the people gathered on the other side of the tape. One man stood out in an extraordinary way. He was dressed in all camouflage. And he thought to himself, I wonder who that is. As he got closer, he began to realize the man standing on the other side of the finish line was his dad. His dad had gotten a leave of absence to come home, to surprise his son and to be there at the finish line. And in that moment, as he got closer and closer to the finish line, tears began to fill his eyes and he forgot about the medals. He forgot about his standing. He forgot about his place. He forgot about his friends. His eyes were glued to his dad and he ran past the tape into the arms of his father. His dad embraced him and said, son, I'm so proud of you. Are you surprised? <clears throat> and all the son could do is, Dad, you're here. I can't believe you're here. And in that moment, all the other things that he thought were significant didn't matter because his dad was there. Can I tell you that at the end of this life, all the medals you worked for, all the achievements that you thought were important, all the accolades, the placing, the status, the pain that you went through in the process will fall to the wayside like a Gatorade cup that's been crushed in the hands of a racer. When you look up and you see the same eyes that Saul of Tarsus saw on the road to Damascus, the same eyes that John the Apostle on the island of Patmos saw in Revelation chapter one, the same eyes that Peter and the other apostles saw on the other side of his resurrection. When we run through the tape of this life and step into eternity, and we see the one who knew us, who called us, and loved us, and we hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, son, daughter. You did it, you did it. The things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and face. Would you stand up with me all over this room? Come on, it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth it, church. What does it cost you? Everything. But your standing cannot be taken away. What's your definition of success? But what's the prize? Would you bow your heads with me all over this room? Lord, today, would you give us an eternal glimpse of that moment? Lord, will you give us a snapshot of your heart, Lord, because Today, what we need to know more than anything is that we're known by you and that you've issued an invitation for us to aggressively pursue knowing you. And the very purpose that we were created for is found in knowing you. Lord, it's a process, it's a press. Sometimes it's challenging, sometimes it's difficult, sometimes it feels frustrating. Sometimes our prayers feel like they bounce off the roof and fall to the ground. Do you even hear us? Or do you even care? And the Lord would say over you today that in the process, I'm shaping you and chipping away the marble off of the masterpiece of you that I've called you to be. Give yourself to the process today. As God is conforming his children into the image of his dear son. I wanna invite our prayer and ministry team to come and make their way up along the front today. And as we close in prayer this morning, 
There's a sweet presence of the Holy Spirit in this place. And I want to encourage you today, if you, if you feel the pain of the process today, don't give up. Don't put it in part. Don't throw it in neutral. If today you're being confronted with the price following Jesus, he's incomparable. There's nothing that compares to him. There's nothing that can be compared to what he has done for us. Our best efforts don't even come close. Today, I want to just encourage you, whatever you're facing, whatever obstacle, whatever challenge, whatever price, whatever pressure you're feeling today, turn to him with it. And maybe you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a relationship. I'm not talking about some religious obligation that you could list off like Paul did. But just really surrendered your heart to say, God, I, I want to know you. I surrender my life. It's not about me getting what I want. I want to please you, the one who has called me and known me and loved me. I want to encourage you, today's the day. Today's the day for you to give your life to Christ. Today, it's time to surrender. And as I pray and I close today, whatever you have need of for prayer, maybe you just need someone to stand with you in the middle of your process. Maybe you're feeling the pain of a moment. Maybe the enemies come at, it, come at you from a different direction, or maybe you just feel alone. Whatever it is, I wanna open up the altars and invite you to come and receive prayer. Lord, today, would you just fill us with vision, fill us with passion, and fill us with the faith that we need to follow you to pay whatever price is necessary so that we can experience breakthrough in this life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.